With your hosts, Lily Mundy, Raj Parikh, and Kyle Sanak, this is the award-winning PRS Journal Club Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the July 2019 edition of PRS Journal Club Podcast. I'm Kyle Sanek, PRS Resident Ambassador from UT Southwestern, and I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Lily Mundy from Duke University and Raj Parikh from Washington University in St. Louis. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Peter Taub, craniofacial plastic surgeon from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, where he holds the titles of Professor of Surgery, Neurosurgery, Pediatrics, Dentistry, and Medical Education. Thank you so much, Dr. Taub, for joining us for this PRS Journal Club Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Delighted to do it. The articles that we will discuss can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all past Journal Club articles. The article we will be discussing is Microvascular Reconstruction of the Nose with a Radial Forearm Flap, a 17-year experience in 47 patients by Drs. Arthur Salibian and Fred Minnick. So in brief, this is a retrospective review article of 47 patients that underwent radial forearm free flap for nasal reconstruction as part of a multi-stage reconstruction for total or subtotal nasal defects. The article goes into detail a little bit on the background of the procedure and then looks at their results. In general, they had two immediate flap losses and one delayed flap loss. They have an average follow-up of six years and a range of ages is from 10 to 72 years of age in terms of patients. After this, they go into detail on their technique for infolding the flap to place the dorsal cartilage and where to inset the flap initially and getting it set up with the nuances of how they use this technique and then later prepping for the second, third, and fourth reconstructions. So I want to get right into it. I think this is an interesting article and you know Dr. Minnick is renowned for his nasal reconstructions. I think it's a useful technique for those really large total nasal defects and the article itself is a nice overview of his specific technique for this first stage of how they do the radio forearm for insetting. I would have liked to see a larger article looking at not just this first stage, but also kind of seeing the evolution over the entirety of the stages. You know, they mention publishing technical details and outcomes of the second stage, forehead flap, and the immediate stages, and late revision stages. So it would have been nice to see all of that and see how Dr. Menick approaches that process when you have these total nasal defects. It would also have been nice to see a little bit more on some of the technical pearls and nuances about tackling these larger nasal defects. The other thing I was thinking about is, you know, this is a very well-renowned, gets a lot of referrals from all over the world for these big nasal defects. And over 17 years, he only had 47 patients. So these aren't incredibly common, but I think it's a very useful tool to have in your toolbox. And the other thing is just kind of generalized thoughts on nasal reconstruction and the importance of it's not a one or two surgery operation. It is four, five, six surgeries to get the reconstruction exactly how you need it to be. So if with that, I want to talk to Dr. Tobin and see what do you think of this article in general and how do you look at this infolded flap technique versus other techniques for nasal reconstruction? I think it's hard to, to argue with Fred Medic, who has done this for his whole career and is really the leader in total nasal reconstruction. I mean, if Dr. Medic espouses a technique that uses a, you know, a free radial forearm flap and can get some of the results he does show at the end of this paper, that's a tour de force. I think it's a great technique, but I agree with you. I think the paper sort of addresses just the initial flap in how to hook that up and how to design it, which certainly is important. But I think you want to see the, the end stages of the technique. In talking with Dr. Menick uh, at some point, I think he had mentioned to me that to get that kind of result, that great result, takes a number of revisions. I don't think it's one, two, or three. I think it's more in a four, five, or six. You really got to thin it uh, and rethin it and reinset it. There's a labor of love involved here. So while they sort of discuss you know, the major first step here, there's a lot that goes into it on the back end, as you mentioned. Yeah, I think that's very true. When I've, when I've uh, talked with Dr. Minnick as well, you know, he mentions and he really harps on this point specifically is a revision is not a failed part of a reconstruction. I mean, you should go into this thinking that you're going to need those multiple revisions to get it as thin and as ideal to get this great result that he shows in these photos. And I think that's the other um, important point that you can glean from this article. The other thing I really liked was, and is important to point out, is he talks a little bit about his second stage where he then um, 
fixates the alar basis to drop when he's doing his forehead flap to get external coverage at a second stage he then drops the alar basis and gets additional lining to thin out the nostrils and to drop them to get improved rotation of the tip and i think that's another really nice maneuver to not just discard that tissue and prevent it from kind of contracting down after that initial contraction happens after you do your forearm flap you know, Dr. Top, have you used any of these prefabricated nose on the forearm that Dr. Prebaz discusses or um, any of the other techniques for these big, large nasal defects? I have, but not on the forearm and not as a free tissue. I trained with Tim Miller at UCLA, and, and Dr. Miller does a beautiful nasal reconstruction. What he would do would be to sort of prefabricate and prelaminate the forehead flap. And what you can do is you can raise up the distal end of that forehead flap, line it with very thin skin, come back, put in some cartilage, and you can actually, with a technique that actually curves that nose using some uh, crushed Xeroform, you can actually build a nasal tip up in the forehead. Again, it's a little funny looking, but so is this in the initial stages. But what Dr. Miller used to do would be to recreate the nose up on the distal portion or the superior portion of the forehead, and then transfer it down. And then what you're transferring down is a really nice looking nose. It lacks that bulk that this technique has, but with this technique that Dr. Manick describes, actually brings in more tissue. So, you know, you don't have to worry about lining so much. You just have to worry about thinning that soft tissue down the road. When you're building the nose on the forehead, like with that technique, with the prefabricated, are you overcorrecting the size of the defect? Because a lot of times after you, you do that and you go re-raise it to actually transfer it down in there, the skin ends up tightening. You don't have the same kind of plasticity that you have in some of the other like native tissue. Are you overcorrecting when he was doing that? A little bit, not too much. Because again, you know, in a total nasal reconstruction, you're not really trying to match it to anything. And that nose is going from nothing to something, to something pretty substantial. So if it's a little smaller than what you envision in your mind, it's probably okay. Lillian Raj, what are you guys doing at Washington Duke? Are you doing any kind of big nasal reconstructions with uh, you know, free flaps or doing mostly just forehead flaps and expanding those out or what are you all doing? So we definitely do a lot of paramedian forehead flaps. I personally haven't done a free flap for nasal reconstruction. We have for other soft tissue defects in the face. You know, I can't speak to maybe there's been one here and there that I haven't been part of. But, you know, I think like a lot of this speaks to the highly specialized nature of this and the number of referrals he's getting for these really large defects. Raj, what do you think? How are they handling these big nasal defects? I think it's really challenging. These patients, I think what Dr. Taub said and what you mentioned uh, from talking to Dr. Medic is completely true. The amount of revisions that you have to do to get kind of the results that are in his paper when you look at the results that he's publishing. Obviously, you know, these aren't common cases, you know, we don't see them that often, but when we do, we have tried total nasal reconstruction in a similar manner uh, that Dr. Medic describes in this paper. You know, we've also tried to prefabricate them where we're putting in the construct in the forearm and then transferring the entire construct, but we've had issues with it. You know, I think I've done three total in the entirety of my training, and I think all three of them had problems. You know, one of them was an infection where the construct actually got infected in the forearm, Another one was just the point where, you know, I think you really need to write patients to patients who are motivated. I think his patient population is people who are seeking him out as kind of one of the world's experts in this. I think when you're doing them kind of in an acute traumatic standpoint and in, in the post-traumatic standpoint, you know, you really have to make sure that you have reliable patients who can consistently come back because I think what you see otherwise is the amount of revisions that this takes, people get discouraged. And if you don't have that relationship and patients aren't really motivated, then you kind of lose them along the road. And, and we've had that certainly happen as well. So it's been very challenging. You know, I think this is something that I think if you do it in your practice, you really have to take the time to think about it comprehensively. Maybe go visit somebody like Dr. Medic and kind of witness and learn these kind of cases from somebody who's a real expert in them because I think they're very challenging. So certainly, you know, our preference is whenever possible is to do a forehead flap as opposed to free tissue transfer. Yeah, Raj, that's great points. I think you hit the nail on the head of having a motivated patient who is on board for the long haul process. And I mean, just looking at that, like Dr. Taub said, you know, six, seven, eight operations to go from no-nos to one that Dr. Menick is kind of presenting. And having someone who understands that this is a multi-year journey is just really, really important. I think patient selection is really, really something that we need to nail if you're going to go do this, these big reconstructions to get the results that Dr. Minnick shows. Dr. Taub, any last thoughts on this article? 
it's a great paper to include here because I think to hear from Fred Menick about what he's doing, uh, and it's probably very different than what he did 17 years ago, it's always good to get an update on what he's doing. You know, I've known that he does a, a free radial forearm flap, but I think what's great about this paper is not so much the results, but he really goes into a lot of detail about how he designs that paddle, the measurements for that paddle, where he bases that paddle on the forearm, the fact that he uses sometimes a little flap for nasal floor reconstruction. I think to go through his thought process on how he's at least starting out this reconstruction is really important. Thank you, Dr. Taub. I think with that, we will end the discussion of this article. Thank you everyone for a great discussion. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share with your colleagues and friends and rate us on the Apple iTunes store. Also remember to tune into the other two articles that we will be discussing on this month's podcast. Finally, please join us for our monthly journal club on Facebook where we will be able to interact directly in real time with this month's selected articles authors. Go ahead and like the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Facebook page if you have not done so already. It is there where our monthly journal club will take place. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Taub, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening to the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast. Please click, subscribe, and leave a ratings or review if you're enjoying what we do every day.